Wow, what a good opening. <laughs> All right. Um, got it. It says there. <clears throat> Yeah, um, <clears throat> when I, oh, what's that doing on there? You've got something to click on your computer. Is that someone else's computer? Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> um, when uh, the subject of <clears throat> parabolic antennas was, uh, was suggested that I might do a talk on it, <clears throat> Um, it seemed like a, a, a okay subject. <clears throat> Having uh, spent a bit of time preparing this uh, PowerPoint here, I realised that <clears throat> it's such a huge subject that that um, <clears throat> this one talk's only going to be the beginning. <clears throat> and my uh, throat's a bit funny tonight. <clears throat> anyway. Um, I'm also, I thought I would start at a, at a, at a simple <clears throat> level, which probably many or most of you know, uh, but it might be good to actually put so, a talk with some simple stuff in it uh, <clears throat> on the net for the uh, for helping other people, newcomers who, who might come along, uh, you know, trawling on the internet, they find something that might uh, be of interest. So um, let's go now, let's see what, uh, Peter has prepared the way for me here. Looks like that might be it. That's a good way to start. Works. Um, it's just got a bar out, I've got to move out of the way here. <clears throat> All right, so uh, it's, I call this loosely a talk about dishes and dish feeds. So uh, we're talking about <clears throat> parabolic dish antennas. What's that noise? Parabolic dish antennas, because <clears throat> I don't know of any other dishes, but um, the fact that they're parabolic is, uh, is, is fairly helpful for what we do. And we could explain why shortly, but um, um, parabolic dish antennas. Do you like that big one? Do you know where it is? Yeah, Doug 3UM. Doug BK3UM, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's 10 metres diameter. He, he lives out in, on a country, in the country somewhere. <clears throat> um, it's a prime focus dish of the late great BK3UM. And uh, um, might be uh, Bob's been there too, but I've uh, I've been there and uh, I watched him steer it around the place. <clears throat> and he's built apart from he, he built it all in his you know the whole controls and the mount and everything itself. It's amazing. Yeah. So uh, anyway, <clears throat> we're going to use the term prime focus for the next little while. So uh, it, what it's got to do is that the focus of the dish is straight out in, in front of the dish. And you need some way of getting in, holding the feed of the antenna right there at the, at the focus. <clears throat> some other examples of prime focus dishes. This is one from uh, VK4AFL, <clears throat> who I thought would be with us tonight, but uh, he's not <clears throat> not yet anyway. Uh, this was a few years ago when he when he had the 2.3 gig system running on uh, on EME. Um, there's one from Italy, <laughs> like wearing a Mexican hat in Italy. <laughs> and um, this one's somewhere in the UK. It, obviously interested in EME because you can see the tail end of a 432 and, and maybe 1296 antenna and, as well as the prime focus dish. Here's um, another very large dish at uh, Lewis Capito um, CT1 DMK in Portugal. <clears throat> and he's uh, he's a, a quietly a, a, a huge achiever in, in terms of EME and, and getting a whole lot of projects done and finished and he's amazing. Um, <clears throat> and this this particular extra dish here uh, 
um, <clears throat> it's with the with the late uh, what's his name, Lyle Patterson, VK two ALU, who ended up in VK six ALU for a little while. <clears throat> but when he was VK two ALU, he d developed this. He, well, he acquired this Andrew dish and uh, developed a, a feed that was perfect for it, <clears throat> and uh, which is probably better than the original Andrew feed. <laughs> Quite a, a remarkable uh, achievement there down in Wollongong in, in New South, South, South of Sydney. <clears throat> and here's something which is only about that, the dishes are only about that diameter, about probably uh, 200 mils or 100, 180 mils or something diameter um, <clears throat> for use on 241 gigahertz, but still a prime focus dish. <coughs> Over the years, I became quite friendly with Ari, VK, sorry, um, PA0, Echo Zulu. And um, so I visited him once, and his array of antennas is pretty special. And not only is there uh, two big 432 yag Yagis on the top, but there is a, uh, uh, a large mesh prime focus dish on 1296. There are solid prime focus dishes with dual, dual band feeds, each one a dual band, so it can cover 2.3, 3.4, 5.7 and 10.3 amongst those two dishes. Mm -hmm. And then right up at the top is the, uh, an offset dish on 24 gigahertz. And <clears throat> he, he was regularly top of the, of the game in, across Europe for many years in probably because his wife allowed him to uh, spend hours and hours and hours playing radio up in the, in the attic. <laughs> but um, he's unfortunately uh, <coughs> not, no longer with us. And I um, don't know where all that good antenna stuff's gone. He was also on a slight hill in the middle of Holland and Holland is flat. Um, so he had all that up in the air on a slight hill in Holland, and tremendous takeoff to right across uh, mm -hmm. Germany and down into the, um, and also up north as well, and over to England. Parabolas. Now, did, ed did everyone do geometry and, um, yeah. and, and math? <laughs> that this is the basic thing you start learning about when, when you're doing uh, parabolas in, in whether it's algebra or whatever a graph of y equals x squared <clears throat> and so when x is, it, it produces a shape like that which is known as a parabola um, the interesting thing is that this what you see on the screen there's only two dimensions because you can actually uh, see it all in a um, um, kind of three-dimensional sense uh, and um, another way of looking at that is to turn the, turn the thing on its side which starts to be a bit more like what we're going to be doing now x equals y squared and um, that's a parabola <coughs> turned on its side but ha just check that out what <laughs> That's a Boeing 777. <clears throat> what's, what's that sort of telling you? The front end of a, the nose end of an of a aeroplane is para, para, parabolic, not a sharp point. And it's actually, it's a, a, a truth of uh, hydro, uh, what's it called? Hydrology and uh, other fluid dynamics that um, a, if a shape of something going through a fluid uh, gets through better if it's a parabolic front rather than as like a sharp end. So anyway, go back to the parabola here. <clears throat> Basic things to, to remember about um, parabolas are that there's an axis of symmetry right down the middle. And to try and think that the nose of the aeroplane there, it's running uh, from the tip of the, uh, the nose of the thing right down through the middle of the aeroplane. Of course, it stops being parabolic after a little while. <coughs> um, 
very important thing about parabolas is that there's a focus point and we won't go into the maths of where to do, well, that's defined but um, the the useful thing about that focus point is that if you've got a, a, a array of or a, a vector of uh, electromagnetic energy coming into the dish parallel to the uh, the what the axis it will always focus on that be reflected onto that focus point and uh, <clears throat> so if it's not coming in at r r parallel to the axis then it will won't hit the focus and it won't be uh, if you've got something at the focus to pick it up then it won't be there but if you got other rays all coming in at the same time that focus is a good place to be <clears throat> um, so let's say we uh, who's ever who's got a uh, um, a parabolic dish of that sort of shape where the uh, the um, the focus is way down inside the dish and that anyone Electric fires used to look like that. Yeah, and uh, headlights on cars. Mm. Um, that's why they're so bright sometimes when you when you, when you accidentally look at them. Um, headlights on cars. I remember as a teenager <clears throat> discovering that the re the reflector off a of a car headlight. I'm talking in the 1960s, at this stage how retrieve the reflector off there and I was walking along on a hot day with my finger in the hole just casually uh, you know carrying the thing at home with uh, other tools and things and every now and again I'd get this little because oh, the, the dish would get all the sunlight on the hot day and would focus it on my finger and it suddenly realized oh <coughs> focus with the if you've got something at the focus it really works well <clears throat> So let's not go back to that other one. Let's not think about the whole big dish. Let's think, think about the part of the parabola that's sort of just in behind the focus. So we're talking about something a bit like that. <clears throat> so it's, it's still there. And the, the good thing about this is that all of those energy vectors coming in <clears throat> If they're uh, all parallel to the axis, then they're, all their reflections will, in fact, end up at the focus. <clears throat> now, the focus is where we like to be. And you can even cut away more and get a fairly shallow sort of dish. But we're still interested in the same uh, focusing of everything at the, at the focus. <clears throat> So here's where we start to get into useful uh, measurements that mean something to radio amateurs. Um, there's the focal length from the, the, the base of the dish out to the focal point, and there's the diameter of the dish. So that leads to the F on D ratio, which is talking about shallow dishes versus deep dishes. Now we've already showed a picture of the deep dishes. That's where the the, um, the shape of the of the parabola is actually coming out nearly out as far as the uh, as the um, as the focus. But compare that with the, the uh, shallow dish is a bit like the picture showing there, where the focal length is way longer than the uh, than the diameter. Um, that's all got to do with gain and, and uh, useful things like, uh, uh, well, the degree to which you have to uh, be precise in, uh, in making the dish or, uh, or locating everything like that. And it's very, very dependent on the wavelength in use as to how critical all that is. Another interesting thing about this it relates to that picture is surface accuracy. Um, remember we said that was x equals y squared or uh, various constants and things that change the, uh, the way it works. If, uh, 
there's obviously an ideal shape for that uh, that uh, bit of para para parabolic reflecting material. But if it's not ideal, in other words, it's got bumps in it, uh, it's got folds or uh, lines, or it's it's made out of flat petals ra rather than a, a t totally parabolic curved shape, then there'll be uh, aberrations on there, which will be on lower frequencies won't be a problem, but um, on higher frequencies will make the dish unusable even. So surface accuracy, how accurate to the parabola is quite an important part of the geometry. <clears throat> we touched on this already a little bit. Larger diameter dishes usually mean higher gain, but they all come coming with that is greater pointing difficulty. <clears throat> if you've got a there's a picture coming up shortly of a of an ideal radiating pattern from a from a, a dish or any antenna actually, any dish antenna. So let's <clears throat> move on. What's going to happen next? Um, now, hypothetical. There's a, a big dish. Believe me or not, a big dish, and you're looking straight down onto it, or into it if it's sitting out. In a vertical way. Um, so the and that's a prime focus dish, a parabola that's that's there. And the it's the focus, of course, is in basically in the middle, but some point above the dish as we're looking into it. Um, what say hypothetical? We we select one part of that big dish and isolate a portion of it, in other words, and uh, cut away all the rest of the big dish. And we're just left with that part that was there. It's the same shape as the original big dish, but um, um, so we're going to isolate that big dish. What? The, okay, the, but remember the, the focus of this whole system, uh, the, the, the focus that belonged to that big dish is still the same and still belongs to this smaller part. So what have we made? We just created an offset dish. See, <clears throat> I hope everyone can see that the, uh, uh, the big dish started well kept going below the purple line on there and kept going down and then became a mirror image or a yeah complementary shape uh, but but what's good about what's the good thing about this is that that focus is now not interfering with the uh, with the 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 radio radiation vectors coming into there so um so the location of the focus and thus the feed is outside of the main beam and that the beam is defined by the original dish, not the cut cutaway portion of it. So <clears throat> as many or most of us know, um, offset dishes are uh, extremely, uh, a very important part of the whole dish scene. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah there are, you have to have different types of feeds that are, as from prime, prime focus. Um, because the, the the focal length, focal f on d ratio, is is considerably larger now. You can't have a, a deep offset dish that I know of anyway. You can only have what looks like a shallow fed uh, offset dish. So we've got to have different types of feeds to to feed them effectively. Here's a <clears throat> another picture from California. <laughs> Um, where everything's big, perhaps it's bigger in Texas, I don't know, but <clears throat> um, there's, a, there's a hill somewhere in the back blocks of, um, of, of, of Los Angeles up in the, the hills where uh, they have these microwave parties up there and uh, people bring along these ginormous dishes and try to work people so far away. Um, and not to be beaten, here are the French out in force on a, on a drizzly day, I guess. And um, the French are 
almost exclusively use offset dishes and they use high powered amplifiers on microwaves and uh, um, it's, it's quite, they're really good achievers in, in this whole amateur radio world of, uh, of microwaves. But there's a group of Frenchmen playing in microwave amateur radio. Now here's an interesting one, what's different? <coughs> it's upside down. Does it still work? Of course. Just turn the graph the other way around. The dish is now pointing. Can you see where the main beam would be? There's a, a feed. Have I got a, yes, I do have a mouse. There's, there's a feed, probably a converted satellite feed. But the radiation pattern of that is from over to there, all the way around to there. And the, uh, well, you're, thank you. <laughs> and the, can you emphasize on there, Kevin, the, uh, where the, the, the main beam of the whole antenna is going to be going? Coming. Straight across, yeah, Straight like across. that. <clears throat> All right, but, but that's, a, that's another way of, of doing this same trick with the, uh, the feed above the, uh, the dish with an offset dish. I can't remember where that picture came from, but uh, obviously someone out on a, on a picnic park on the top of a hill somewhere, which is good fun. I don't know why these ones were set up in the in the bulrushes. Maybe it's a uh, close to the water edge of the water somewhere, which is a, a good place to do on a on a hot steamy um, summer day when you want to play microwaves low right across the uh, the water, only a meter or two above the water level works. Now here, one of our uh, people online at the moment knows very well what this one is. That's uh, um, Stefan's uh, 122 gigahertz system, which works very well. Now, <clears throat> whether it's a prime focus dish or an offset dish, this is the sort of radiation pattern we're, uh, we're aiming for. Can you achieve that with on v, with VHF antennas? <laughs> yeah, maybe that uh, a Russian fellow with 170 or so uh, two meter beams on a big big gantry. Maybe he got something a bit like that, but uh, but this is quite achievable with with patterns with uh, dishes like we amateurs would tend to use. Um, why didn't that move on? So let's move on to that. That was talking about dishes generally, you know, so we go back to that, pat, that image. Dishes generally should be able to achieve something like that. Main big sharp focus. There will always be some side lobes, but, um, way down in relation to the, uh, the, the main lobe. I wonder why that doesn't go black. No video. <laughs> so let's move on to the subject of feeding a dish. And um, feeding a dish, what are we talking about? <coughs> How to actually get RF energy into the dish and reflect it out of the dish in a um, um, to create a, a radiation pattern like we just saw. Uh, <clears throat> what, there's, there's more to it than meets the eye. Um, where the, Doug MacArthur up there has a, um, um, I think that's a W2IMU uh, feed on 1296, might be, I think it is. But he also has uh, 432, two, uh, sets of across dipoles on that the, that square plate be closer to the dish and what you can see is actually reflected from there. So he's using this dish on 432 and 1296 on, uh, on EME, but he's also able to use it terrestrially because of where he is located and, <coughs> and he's done some very interesting experiments with terrestrial and uh, 
even on sporadic E on 432. But quite an amazing bloke is, was Doug. Now, when we're talking about feeding a dish, um, keep in mind the ideal dish feed. And so what features has it got? It's got perfect illumination. We'll discuss that shortly. It's infinitely small. Is that achievable? <laughs> And it's 100% efficient. So um, what do we mean by this? And this, remember, we're talking about the ideal here. Perfect illumination. Well, there's a picture of a perfect, maybe a perfectly illuminated dish. The radio frequency energy starts at that focus, radiates out, ar arrives at the dish evenly, spread right across the dish, and um, uh, it, it, it spreads itself, um, it stops spreading outside the dish. And it, so it doesn't do that, is what I'm trying to get to. Uh, what would happen if, if that was, if you're using that system there? You'd be spraying some of your transmitter energy or um, <clears throat> off there on, into the ground or wherever it's behind the dish, it's not much use anymore or you'd be receiving noise, increased amounts of noise if you're in receive mode, because you're picking up the ground uh, left and right of the right, top and bottom of the dish. That's called over illumination. Um, but re remember it needs also to be evenly spread right across the dish. Um, compare that with the, the this sort of graph. <coughs> Notice the, the general shape of the dish. This is a fairly deep dish. And it's, it's actually a problem trying to feed deep dishes to actually get enough illumination there. So this is called under illumination. Um, this is uh, a diagram from um, uh, W1GH said, which is quite interesting talking about illumination. There, you can see the, the dish, the, the parabolic line there. So we're interested in all the RF that's heading for that dish right out to the, the, the top and the bottom of the, uh, of the figure of the, of the parabola there. But if you've got a, a real world uh, feed, some of it's gonna be, that's nearly right. I mean, you could get it much worse. If it's nearly right, you're still going to have spillover going over illuminating with the, the rays going up from the red part. And then for the illumination out at the, the, the extremities, you can see it's not going to be as much RF arriving there as there is in the middle of the dish. So uh, what would be ideal is that it would be even right across, but it's not because that a funny shaped ellipse thing is in fact showing how the, uh, the, the, the feed is radiating into the dish. And that it'll vary from one to the next. <coughs> so here's a different type of dish. This is a fairly shallow dish. Um, but look, here, there's a real world teardrop thing on its side over illuminating a bit on spilling over a little bit on the outside and um, and failing to illuminate completely right up to the, the extremities. So <clears throat> another real world situation it would be a very deep dish. If you tried to do this with a some of the there are some feeds that try and do this, but it's really, really difficult. Not, let's say you got it right, so there's no spillover loss going, there's no red showing in that picture, but the illumination is still varying right across when, you, when you're trying to illuminate a, 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 a deep dish like that. Why would it be useful to be inf infinite, have your feed infinitely small? <laughs> well, the geometry of a par parabola doesn't have a little area for a focus. It's got one point. 
So if you're trying to use that and emulate that, it's um, uh, if you've got parts of the feed that, that are slightly away from the actual focus, it, it, then, then there are different, different reflections and things happening going into the dish and the dish is, is no longer uh, properly illuminated. It's going to be have variations in the way it works simply because the, the, the feed is a, a physically measurable size and it's not infinitely small. And the other thing about the, what's good about having a small feed structure, particularly on a prime focus dish, is that it doesn't block transmitted RF bouncing straight back to the feed. So here's an interesting picture coming from W1G8Z again. Have a look at that. <coughs> The let's say that there's a um, RF energy is being um, fed to that feed there, and it, it's being radiated out according to the, the pattern of the feed. Um, it's going to illum illuminate all of the all of the surface of the dish, but look at the, the the what's going to happen to the illuminations that are not shown there. Um, in the, the gap in the middle. The, 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 that, where's your mouse? Yeah, can you? That, that triangle area in, in, in there is, is dead area because the, the rays that go out to the, the dish and then reflected out of the dish are obstructed by the, uh, the or blocked by the, 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 the shape of the feed. And that, if, it's, if the feed's only small, that can be fairly insignificant. But if the feed is taking up a bit of space, um, then you've got the mo killing the most of the, or some of the reflections from the most efficient part of the dish, which is straight there and straight back again. So um, <clears throat> it's one reason why people like to use uh, offset dishes. Now, the other idea was, 100% efficiency. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Ever thought to think about what are the losses that are, that happen in a real dish, which all need to be considered and optimized to get good performance out of it? <clears throat> and might I say at the outset that Doug VK3UM having been there has, has left a great legacy to the amateur radio world of spreadsheets and um, and the little um, algorithms and things like that which uh, add a, which draw your attention to every one of the losses that could be uh, upsetting the the efficiency of a real dish and they um, it's got them there and you can download things to do with dishes and EME programs and EME operation and everything. It's um, quite uh, quite good. <clears throat> but here's a, here's a list of all the things that we need to consider or optimize. Illumination loss. <coughs> Remember that I, I talked about there are parts of the, extra, ex, the outside of the dish around the rim that get less illumination so that's a, a loss due to the, uh, the radiation pattern of the feed as it's looking into the dish. Spillover loss. That's just over illuminating and, and energy that's, that's, that's lost or on receive. Um, it's noise that's coming back into the, uh, into the receiver from uh, behind the dish. And if you're pointing upwards to the moon, then you've, you've got the, the uh, the earth behind you, which is noisy. Feed blockage loss, we talked about that a moment ago, but it can, it's measurable, uh, or certainly estimatable. Phase error. <clears throat> now, phase error losses come in because uh, there are uh, uh, basically part of the, one of the reasons is that the feed is larger than a point source. And there are different parts of the uh, of the feed that are uh, uh, they're all radiating, of course, in numbers of directions. So there'll be places across the uh, reflector 
and places in the in the beam out front where uh, uh, there's, there's going to be losses and cancellations due to uh, phase differences between parts of the uh, radiation vectors going out in, or onto the dish and then away. The, what if the feed's not at the focus? It's just not efficient. You can still work, it's sort of in a skew angle away, but, um, and probably many of us have, have operated a dish with it with the feed and not at the focus. <laughs> But it's good to know where that focus is and, and put it there, put the feed right there. Diffraction from the edge of the dish. What's diffraction? It's, it's as a, a some radiated energy goes over a, 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 a like a discontinuity in space, which is that that's the edge of the dish. Um, there's a whole spray of uh, of um, of RF energy uh, being diffracted. Um, that's a bit uh, a bit lossy. <clears throat> um, one of the things that uh, some EME operators do is to actually put a, a an extra fringe around the outside of the main part of their, their dish. And that's partly to uh, stop the um, extra well to reduce spillover not to gain much out of collecting that spillover but to stop the noise getting in at the back but it's also um will, re will reduce this uh, diffraction from the edge of the dish issue um <clears throat> if you play around uh with the or if you've got a dish that's not exactly perfect in shape then there'll be um, a tendency to, because of phase shifts and things, to um, to lead to a slight change in polarization. Meaning, you know, you might be wanting to be horizontal or vertical. Um, wouldn't be, wouldn't affect circular, of course. Um, <clears throat> and it, we might be a few degrees off. Blockage by the feed supports. Remember that big dish of, of dugs there. You could say, well, the, those things are 100, 150, 150 mil diameter rods. But look at the the, the area of the whole dish, and uh, that was really quite minimal amount of blockage. But if we've got smaller dish, then the feed supports that are in the RF field near close to the dish uh, could be in fact interfering with what's going on. I mentioned that earlier, surface area in the parabolic reflector will make it less efficient. Um, that means it's got wobble and uh, and, and uh, ripples and things like that, or, or dings. <laughs> I once had a uh, fairly large dish, um, a solid um, offset dish, a meter and a half diameter, I think it was, something about that, and um, uh, it, it had, I got it for nothing because uh, it had been dinged and <clears throat> Stefan uh, tried it out for me and he's quite happy to use it on uh, 2.4 gigs and 3 gigs but it was not very good for, for anything you know above about well probably 5 would be a maximum you'd try and use it for instead of the original KU band at 14. Feed line loss is natural. Uh, that doesn't affect the dish so much, but it's efficiency of the whole system. And feed uh, VSWR, <coughs> direct losses and things which go into the whole uh, sum of every, all the other losses that we've been talking about. So th that's what would be ideal I'm here to tell you that there's no real life feed which matches all of that. Does anyone know of one? Um, so let's look at some practical dish feeds, dish feeds that do work. And uh, there are many different types. Um, if you go to uh, W1GHZ's antenna book, <coughs> which I encourage you to do, it's, it's a go-to 
this is coming up as a big anyway um it's a it's a wonderful work very useful and written by amateurs for amateurs but there's a list of all the different types of dish feeds that are known to exist or certainly by uh by paul w1ghz that some of them are there twice because they if you look at um second from the bottom on the left there's kuma and that's exactly the same as ve4ma because that's what it is it's exactly the same <laughs> And there are one or two other repeats. Um, <coughs> so there's a big long list. And what's useful about this list here is that you can pick and choose what is your F on D ratio, and you can pick the ones that are close, going to be best to uh, work with your uh, F focus on, on diameter ratio. So there's the. Um, the main reference to um, to that well that's that's looking at the antenna book chapter six six point two there's actually the a separate page which is the index so you don't just go straight to this one you might even backtrack a little bit and find the uh, the actual index and then you know, there are hyperlinks coming out of the index to each one of these specialist uh, um web uh, pages and here's a fundamental decision that will affect what you you might be doing and what's possible in your uh, world do you need linear polarization vertical or horizontal or do you need circular polarization that's that's not for the antenna to decide it's for uh it's for you to, to <coughs> decide if you're not going to use uh, EME, then you're probably going linear. Although lots of EME is, has been done on microwaves uh, with horizontal only, but a huge amount of um, of EME with large dishes and all is certainly from uh, 1296 up to uh, five gigs is is done with circular polarized um, systems. So what do you want to do? Leave it with you. <clears throat> so once you've worked out what you need there, then you could go and look at the various, um, uh, you've got to work out what dish you, you've got to know what dish you, you've got and, and it's F on D ratio. And then you got to look at um, uh, the various feeds. So let's start looking at, at some feeds here. Now I couldn't get a good picture of a, of a basic dipole and, and reflected dipole feed for a dish. I've seen them many times but I just haven't got a picture and I couldn't find one. That's a, a, a Heath Robinson one that's, um, <coughs> that uh, is, is there from some hobby um, website that I found it on. Oh, there's the address on the side. Um, but that's a dipole feed. So that's actually um, would radiate back towards us in the, well, down in the axis of the, the big bit of um, hardline coax going down the middle. It's a reflector at the top right and uh, it's a dipole feed in the middle there. A bit, another a way of looking, and that would be coaxial fed to the dipole. Now here's a dish that I actually put together myself. It's a, it's a prime focus dish and it's got a waveguide fed dipole feed. Um, <clears throat> so I hope you can imagine that in the middle of this dish here. If you want to look at, at a closer look at the dipole, that's it. Um, can you imagine the radio frequency energy in the waveguide? Um, coming up the waveguide and then being uh, squeezed down into that lower height um, part of the waveguide. It still works because of the other distances, all right. And then that's popping out through that gap at the end of the waveguide and then illuminating and exciting resonance in that first little dipole. And that's a, that's a full size dipole on 10.3 gigs. And then um, the reflector, I'm, I'm sure you can see the reflector is just a little bit 
longer than the uh, that dipole, and that reflector, like you might expect in good Yagi technology, is uh, reflects a large amount of the uh, RF back um, back into the dish, and so you get a that's a dipole feed. So Paul, in his book here, looks at each one of these types of feeds, and um, and provides information and you start to real after you get used to it for a while this works much better than mine um it's not working it just work it out clear maybe it's not you took your computer away no it's computer this is working there you go oh, okay i'll move it over here yeah. good okay so let's look on this left hand side here this first diagram this is the front to back ratio basically um, so here is the front of the dish over on the side, and it's giving you the um, the E plane and the H plane. In other words, right angle planes. If it's a dipole, they're obviously not going to be the same as each other, and that's what you get. <clears throat> um, fairly broad, as you might expect, of with a two element di uh, two element beam, a broad front ra pattern of radiation, and a fair bit of it going backwards as well. So it's only looking at 10 dB front to back ratio. Um, so when you come over here, what you find is that this dish, look, look how, um, how wide that is. That's really puffing out a whole lot of RF uh, in, in front of the dish out from left and right. So it actually works best with a, a deep dish. See how it's peaking here at 0.25 uh, F on D ratio. So that's the radiation pattern that relates to that type of antenna. Um, but it's got other things here. Look at spillover. As you get a, a slightly smaller dish, huge amount of RF is being radiated away outside of the dish itself. So the spillover is, is, is awful. <laughs> but they still work. Um, radio amateurs don't have everything working perfectly. I didn't hope you know. <laughs> um, there's other couple of the little measurements in each one of these graphs. I'm not going to stop and spend this much time on each one. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, blockage and there's, uh, oh, what's the other one? Oh, illumination. <clears throat> That, I think that illumination is looking at the illumination losses due to uh, the, you remember I talked about that failure to, to get all the RF energy right out to the, the thing. So if there's a dish, that's the green line, as the dish gets deeper and deeper, it starts to become more significant loss. So the red line is what you're really looking at. And you'll see with various different ones, the uh, red line peaks around here or up here somewhere other and you know that that's suitable for a, an F on D ratio of a certain amount. So here is another type of antenna and uh, for those of you in the room here, um, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the EIA, which is the Electrical Industry Association dual dipole reference antenna. Um, this was established um, with the help of the Andrew Company to um, provide a, a simple, measurable and repeatable reference for doing antenna measurements. And so this has a, a gain of 7.7 of, uh, .7 dB, I think it is. Over a uh, over a dipole, so um, and it consists of simple dipoles here, which are separated by a half wavelength, and then a, um, they're all a quarter wavelength of, above the uh, above the reflector. So you, what there now we're talking about that we can go straight to the the graph. You can see the front to back ratio is a lot better. Front to back ratio is a lot better over here in this part here. It's still got the dipole effect where the E plane and the H plane don't look alike. 
<clears throat> but look here, it's suitable for a dish of, I better read it correctly with my glasses, um, 0 0.45 to 0 0.5. Very well defined peak and not doing too badly, a bit over 70%. But remember, these are uh, re not real world figures. They're, uh, they're basically modeled through an NEC program. Next example is a loop feed. <clears throat> These have become popular, multiband loop feeds have become popular as well. Um, but uh, they were started out by deal for MVA. But look at here, the loop feeds got a bit of the dipole effect, but not so bad. But it's, it's useful for a slightly deeper dish, but not a, rare, not a very deep one. But it's quite capable of, uh, of uh, losing a lot of its illu uh, illumination of the energy um, out to the sides of the dish. Um, <clears throat> so if you go, if you're in Paul's book, you go to 6.3, uh, you, you're, you're with uh, circular waveguide feeds. So here we're talking about about things that look like circular waveguide or that are in fact circular waveguide. Coffee can feeds. <coughs> Who's ever made a coffee can feed for a, yep. for a, uh, a dish? They work. Um, the 4MA uh, feed uh, and then the chaparral styles of feed. So there's a um, coffee can Commonly known as coffee, it might be a soup can in Australia, or it might be a uh, baked beans can <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> but um, uh, all it consists of is the a, a can of the right size, <clears throat> a feed which is simply connected to a probe, and then an adjustment um, on the opposite side of that to uh, to optimize the the uh, electric excuse me the electrical characteristics of the feed. So you can imagine it's fairly simple <clears throat> and uh, there's no fixed um, requirement. You can have, let's go back to the pictures. You can have different diameter cans. You can have probes that are longer or shorter. They'll work in different ways at different frequencies. So uh, what Paul has done with this result here is uh, given a, a, a call of a, a nest of results based on different um, whatever these ratios are here. Um, anyway, there's variations. But generally speaking, not real smart in the uh, front to back ratio, but better than a dipole. Um, fairly broad illumination, but a dipole will actually illuminate better down in the, in the really deep dish department. You see, this is up at there, but we're only looking between 60 and 70% efficiency. It's coffee can feeds. But they, they work. And in fact, I've worked from Mount Gravatt or um, even Springbrook, worked uh, Wayne, VK4 WS, who was operating up on the Sunshine Coast somewhere or other, but he just has a coffee can, coffee can feed uh, pointed in my direction without a dish, just using the coffee can itself. Now, VE4MA <coughs> is a well-known uh, microwave e experimenter, Barry Mallow Mello and Chuck in Canada um, with, from Manitoba. And, um, but he's, he's also a, an engineer. So he, he was, in the early years, he, he was very aware of what was being published in various antenna um, things. And the, a, a fellow by the name of Kumar, had done this research into this type of thing where there's circular waveguide here, which is represented by this inner circle, circular waveguide coming out here. And then the very helpful effects of putting a, a, a kind of a, a ring affair at the back of that set back just a little bit from the front of the waveguide. And Kumar just had reported this, but no one was using it. But 
Barry saw this and said, hey, we can use that. And so he came up with, and everyone now knows it as a VE4MA feed. And that's what it looks like. Pretty big thing. Say that one, that one's probably on 1296. It could be, you know, three or 400, 400 mil diameter, maybe even more. You can make them bigger or smaller and they have different effects in different ways. <coughs> and then there is a, uh, a, a dish of medium F on D ratio, not really deep, but not really shallow. And the, F, the, the, the 4MA feed is, um, is there at the focus of that prime focus dish. So look how even it is in the vertical plane and the horizontal plane. It's, it's lovely. And look over here, well defined, it's getting up to 80% efficiency here at a F on D ratio of about point, uh, um, I can't read that, it's 0.35 or something there, and about that. Yeah. So um, uh, it's got, of course, if, with anything that's radiating a lot of energy out left and right, it's got, uh, if you're not careful about it, you'll lose a lot by spillover. Um, and the for the same reasons, the illumination, which one's that one? Yeah, that's the illumination losses if you, if you're feeding it into a, if you're trying to go very wide, then you're going to have losses simply because the, at the outset, the, uh, the, the RF getting to the ring, the rim of the dish isn't as good, but still very, very uh, good feed. <coughs> and uh, this one here um, may not look terribly different to the other one, but it's, it's actually to a newer design called the VE4MA super feed. Um, oh, I thought I had a, I did have it, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I think that one was the, the one that graphs, is graphed here is, if you look up in the top left there, it's a Super V for MA feed um, that was actually put on the modeling computer with that result. What exactly is the difference between the standard and the super? Um, I don't know. I've never made one. Okay. Fair enough. But it, they're very similar, obviously. Um, it would appear that that gap across between there and there might be a different ratio to the rest of the size yeah. of things between there and there. That would appear in those pictures, but I can't be sure. Someone else might know. Who's online who knows? No? Unmute first. All right. <clears throat> Still talking about circular feeds. You often talk about um, chaparral feeds, but <clears throat> uh, chaparral is the name of a company um, that, uh, French company that started to produce these, but, um, and they found they worked fairly well with very deep dishes. Um, <clears throat> these multiple rings is a bit like what we've just seen, but there are multiples of them and a slightly more than a quarter wavelength deep and space less than a quarter wavelength. And they, they create what electromagnetic professionals call a soft surface, one that reflects energy like a surface reflects energy, but does not conduct surface currents. So you get less edge currents uh, in, the, in the outside of there. So they're not generating side loads. And that's the, the, the big value of the type of feed. It, they were commercial ones, but amateurs have, have made these. And so Chaparral is in fact a, a company brand like uh, Masonite and uh, Biro. <laughs> um, but everyone talks about Chaparral feed, but look, see, it's, it's work coming up to a pretty good peak here, approaching 80, but 75% at about 0.3 F on D ratio. So um, it's interesting, there's a this thing here. Not to, it's better in the front to back ratio anyway, for, for a very deep dish. So these 
the, this information is given for every one of those types of, in, in, in Paul Wade's book, for every one of those types of feeds that we've been talking about, you can look at this and pour over them and think, well, I need that for my job. I hope you've all got a job that you need it for. See you on air. Um, <clears throat> so here's someone experimenting with feeds in their home workshop. And there's a obviously some sort of VE4MA type feed there. Um, and here's a chaparral feed that they've made. I would guess it's probably operating on five gigs or three gigs or something. So some summary points uh, for circular waveguide feeds. The original VE4MA provides a good efficiency for a wide range of dish F on D ratios. The larger version, which we call the super VE4MA provides, there you are, there's a clue to the difference, mm -hmm. provides excellent efficiency, the highest efficiency to date for a prime focus dish but only over a smaller range of dish F on D ratio. So if you get, you, you win on the swings, you lose on the roundabout. Yeah. And smaller versions of the V4MA feed work as well as the original over a broad range of ring dimensions, offering lower blockage for very small dishes. And finally, you get very good efficiency out of a chaparral type feed for a wide range of dish F on D ratios, and for very deep dishes, absolutely the best. Variations with shallower dip rings have higher efficiency than more traditional dimensions. So you can play around to your heart's content with a lathe, um, make lots of chaparral reflectors, and I think you'd be uh, surprised. Now, horn feeds. You'd think a horn would be the best thing to put there because it seems to be relatively small. But that's what we wanted to do with waveguide coming up <coughs> and then a horn. So the horn could in fact be rectangular, uh, flared in all directions. It could be rectangular in uh, E-plane or H-plane uh, sector kind of um, spread out, it could be a conical horn or it could be a, uh, uh, what do you call that? A, a, a flared yeah. horn. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> interesting thing, when you're starting to think about horns, <clears throat> one way to think of a horn is, is to think of it as an impedance transformer, transitioning from the impedance of the waveguide to the impedance of free space. Won't read the whole lot of that. Um, but if you've got a horn there, it'll do better than the open waveguide, basically is what they're saying. <clears throat> so here, here's an example of a, uh, <clears throat> a WR90 small horn illuminating a, a prime focus dish. Wonderful um, front to back ratio, fairly, not too bad in terms of E-plane and H-plane similarity. Um, <clears throat> um, but look at that. You're starting to need a fairly uh, shallow dish to actually be able to operate best with a, with a horn. <clears throat> now that probably says that they're pretty good for uh, um, offset dishes because offset, offset dishes are already up the to the more to the right of the uh, of the picture, and uh, <clears throat> he uh, Paul in his book exp <coughs> explores many uh, types of horn feed, and uh, I'm not going into them here. So <clears throat> you can get a rectangular feed horn to work in, uh, with a whole range of shallower dishes and, uh, and, and they're fairly forgiving and they're easy to make. <coughs> and uh, as I said and already mentioned, for a, a satellite off offset dish, they generally work pretty well. <coughs> 
Now, getting moving into uh, <clears throat> getting towards the end of everyone, so stay awake. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, the whole idea of dual mode feeds. <coughs> You've got to think a little bit in the next level of, um, <coughs> of complexity. <coughs> if you think about a simple cylindrical wear feed horn or a coffee can thing or a, or a circular waveguide feed or something like that, <coughs> They quite, quite often have um, poor front to back ratio, not the coffee can, sorry, not the um, uh, chaparral type, but anyway. The backward radiation misses the reflector resulting in, in decrease in efficiency and decrease in gain. The, the, the unwanted backward radiation is a result of edge currents in the rim of the horn. Plain rectangular and hot conical horns have the undesired lobes due to those edge currents. So continuing the argument here, you can use choke rings like you do in the FBE4MA and the chaparral things. And, um, but also we're halfway down there. Another technique for edge current reduction is to propagate and, ra and radiate additional waveguide modes in the horn. So not only is there the same basic field pattern in the in the horn. So when if you get the the right magnitude and the right phase of these, <coughs> these modes may be used to shape the radiation pattern for a better illumination of the dish. And so enter the the, the W2 IMU dual mode feed. So here he is uh, talking about. The, the combining of these two waveguide modes in the one um, propagation uh, tube and uh, using different diameters and things to get the phase correct. And you end up with something that looks a bit like that. Um, and I've got, well, Kevin and I have got those things uh, operating on 47 gigahertz. So. Mm. <clears throat> So there's a, a, a table there, which I'll leave everyone to just explore later, which is quite interesting for, for different aperture diameters. Um, uh, <clears throat> you can pick off different gains and, uh, and side lobe angles and, and beam widths and things like that. So Look how amazing the front to back ratio <laughs> has now become. <coughs> 30, 30 to 40 dB uh, down in the, in the H plane. Um, and look where it operates best, shallow dishes. Sorry. Yeah, offset dishes, shallow, very, very shallow dishes. I was talking about shallow dishes. I didn't mention that there was a, a tendency about 30 or 40 years ago for people to make stressed dishes. You'd have a ring of flat things like that, and then you'd pull all of them up to a, a focus point up here with non-conductive rope, and that would be a perfect parabola. And um, they were called stressed dishes, and they were, but they had to have feeds with uh, very uh, um, well-defined things like that. So you can see that's working pretty well for a um, shallow dish. So here's a reasonably shallow dish here at um, some Alaskan station. And the blue thing is in fact uh, a W2 IMU feed on 1296. So you can have a look at it more closely. <coughs> so you've now seen the, uh, uh, the results They work, work very well. And it's a EME, people love them. So that's uh, <clears throat> as far as I've got. When you, you look at the whole area of uh, parabolic dishes and amateurs trying to set them up and use them, um, there are many more issues that I, and there are more than I've got on this little list here as well. We could spend, an hour talking about cassegrain feeds for very deep dishes. In other words, secondary reflectors. 
and uh, studying how they, they, they how you can design them and make them. You could go into multiband feeds. You know, I've got some pictures here of um, there's a, a five gig and ten gig multi two band feed, and there's a ten gig and twenty four gig um, dual band feed, and um, there are other interesting gadgets you, you can pour over here. Here's a simple thing which could be used as a, uh, a dual band feed on, um, what's it say? 900 to 2.6, so it could be 1296 and 2.4 gigs, that one, as it is, except the face center is going to be uh, in a different place for each of those bands. Anyway, so multi-band feeds, we could spend time looking at it. <coughs> um, prime focus dishes versus offset dish. Well, we've touched on that one already, but you could explore that some more. Mucking around with and studying more the position and the angle of the feed and what, where the face center of the feed is. And <coughs> if you look closely at a lot of W1 GHZs, um, information he's actually got a little note there that phase center is 0.1 or 0.2 for the particular feed phase center is a is a, is a small uh, amount different from the actual plane of the opening of the uh, of the feed septum feeds very good way of uh, it's kind of stirring up the fields inside a uh, uh, circular waveguide and um, and generating circular polarization and the, the way you mount the dish, you know, it doesn't come simply. Uh, you've got, it's got to be a, a rigid way, but you've got also got to be able to pack it up and drive, or drive off with it. Um, I don't know how those French people uh, get such big, heavy tripods <laughs> into their system. And steering methods, it, as the dish gets bigger, you need something stronger not only to hold it rigid, but to actually move it around under uh, uh, one less, better than one degree readout ability. And finally, wind loading, loading considerations. So who wants to take on one of these and prepare a talk on uh, one of these subjects? I uh, invite you to. Uh, that'd be a good way to do it, uh, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's just about the end of everything from this talk tonight, except there is a, uh, a translation of all of that information in W1GHZ's book, that if you've got a, a, a dish that's 10 wave, wavelengths diameter, you know, that's fairly big on 1296, but uh, quite achievable on uh, 10 gigs, then for different um, F on D ratios, there are preferable um, types of feed and they're varying obviously from the v, mostly V4MA <laughs> designs and then when they get really shallow, uh, sorry, deep dishes, then it's the chaparral feed. So there you are, friends. Happy to uh, Happy to uh, take any questions if you've got any. And I may not be able to answer them. Okay, so Doug, I'll get you to turn your microphone off and I'll turn, turn mine, mine on. on. This out of the way. Okay. okay. Well, thank, well, thank you very, you very much, much, Doug. Doug. And, and um, um, now let's, now let's get, get everybody, everybody up. up on the screen. There we go. Have we got any um, any questions for Doug at all, either from here in the room or on Zoom? You've stunned them all into silence. Daniel. Uh, just in relation to the, the, the dish with holes in it, does any mesh, much, yeah, does the mesh um, lose much of the signal <coughs> having the holes in it, or is it always better to have a solid dish? Can people hear Daniel's question? Daniel was asking a question about the mesh on the on the back and whether you lose much through it. 
And what's the advantages of, uh, of using it? Well, so it's, it depends on the size of the hot mesh, the holes in the mesh. Um, there is a, a lower frequency limit, sorry, a high frequency limit. Um, on lower frequencies, it makes very little difference. Um, if you were to <coughs> look at that huge, um, <coughs> a huge dish that I showed from uh, Doug VK3 uh, UM, just realized my mic's not, not on. This one's on though. Okay. Um, if you look at that huge uh, dish there, that was actually a mesh dish, but with quite tiny holes on it. It was rated for use up to 12 or 14 gigs or something like that. Um, but that's unusual. I mean, the, the typical classic thing is a radio amateur is trying to get a, a 2.4 gig um, grid pack. You know what that is? And then you're running it on three gigs or five gigs, even three gigs will be more lossy. Yeah, but that's extreme, you know, you've got big gaps and things like that. So, yes, it does make a difference. <coughs> Mainly on the higher frequencies. Well, on a higher, every dish has got a, you know, a frequency that will start to get lossy. And, and also, to the, um, the signal by the time that hits the dish and reflects back. Um, if you've got different parts where it's been reflected from, there's a different time that it hits back. Does that yeah. influence it at all? Yeah. Well, phase differences. Yeah. At the end of the day, it would be really good to have uh, everything in phase. But that's a practical, almost an unachievable goal. There will always be some losses due to that. As a, as a rule of thumb, I don't know how true it is that I always, um, in the UK end, it's always said that the, if the size of the, the mesh is less than 0.1 of a wavelength, it behaves as though it's solid. It behaves as though it's a so on 10 gigs, three centimeters. If it's 0.3 centimeters, is the, it's the equivalent to having a solid shield there. And of course, the, the advantage of having mesh is that first, they're lighter. And second, they got lower wind loading because there's somewhere for the air to blow through. So it's a it's a trade off. In an ideal world, we all have solid dishes, but they're heavier and they got more wind loading and they take more steering. Um, so it's a, it's a way of trying to make them portable to put them on. They're not used commercially too much with oh the very small mesh dishes, aren't they? So if you've got if you've got mesh that's like chicken wire. It's it's going to work, but not on ten gigs, because that's just going to let the, at that point the, 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 there's going to come a wavelength where it'll it'll go through the dish, it'll go through the mesh. So just thinking about the uh, the wind loading of solid dishes, the, the places where you see them are on substantial towers that are anchored to the ground with mm. you know, huge footings, and, or uh, on top of that building at Wollongabba. You know, there used to be a whole nest of dishes there, or even on Mount Gravatt. Um, they're nearly all gone now because they've all gone to fibre optics, I think. And just curious too, um, one dish exactly the same as the other dish, is that the ideal scenario or can you have one dish twice the size of the other dish and, and you have losses and gains? Are you talking, I'm not sure. Like a transmit to receive. Oh, it doesn't matter. Anything, anything. Coffee can feed at this end of the dish at that end is quite okay. Yeah. But I mean, it won't work as well. You won't work DX. Yeah. Unless you're on top of the hill. <coughs> good questions, Daniel. Yeah, they're good questions. But the, the, the gain of a dish depends on the frequency you use. It's the number of wavelengths across. Isn't that, that's correct, isn't it, Doug? So a dish gets become gives you more and more gain as the frequency goes up. So quite a, quite a small dish will give you the on twenty four gigs will give you the same gain as the great big eighteen foot dish. Peter's showing us some um, copy cam type feeds or cylindrical waveguide feeds. Well, this is actually a beer syrup can from my home brewing that days. That's a two point four <laughs> gig, and this is an asparagus can, not a soup can for three point four. <laughs> 
just happened to be the right diameter. I, I took a took a ruler into Carl's. I must look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Ex I did exactly the same. I got, almost got kicked out of IGA for having a micrometer up and down the, the tin <laughs> section, trying to find something for five point seven. It, it turned out to be smoked paprika. That was the only thing that came in the the tin that uh, that was ideal for five point seven. Gary was asking, uh, does the um, does the rust on the outside uh, does it help or hinder? Well, I haven't used these in a long time, uh, Gary. I've got other feeds now, but that was my first initial foray into microwaves, and I think I took them over to Doug's place years ago, and he helped me do the return loss to got the tuning screws on the other side that I brazed in and stuff like that. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I haven't used them for a while. I've got other feeds now, but I do keep them just as backups because they're still... But I, I suspect it would, would affect it a bit because they wouldn't reflect as well. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from anybody from uh, is off from the field off from the floor here? I've just got a, a, a probably a, a real nudie type question. What's the best material to make a dish out of? Or doesn't it really matter. Hmm. Copper. <laughs> gold. <laughs> yeah, gold. Actually, yeah, that's even better. All, okay. all platinum. I should have. I should have, uh, I should have prefaced that with the common sense. Uh, material that, that's affordable well uh luke wasn't it um yeah. <clears throat> i would venture to uh, suggest that making a, a dish is quite a, and getting it to be a proper parabolic shape is uh, is not a not a short and they're not an easy thing um much better to uh, take advantage of the communications industry and the satellite tv industry where the, the, the the squillion uh, things are available on the black market. <laughs> Sorry to uh, disappoint you, but <coughs> remember, I partway through the talk, I talked about the uh, the stress dish where you have yeah. some little things and then rope them up to the point above, and you end up with a good shallow parabolic dish. They work quite well. People used to use them on uh, EME up to two gigs. Okay. And that was probably uh, with, with um, chicken wire reflector, not um, not uh, solid stuff. Fair enough. Yeah. <clears throat> Once you start getting interested in this, you'll find that you don't want to actually go and try and make a parabola, but uh, you get them from all over the place. <laughs> Fair enough. All good. Thank you. I'm just trying to find your photo on my phone. They don't even have to be made of metal. Colin has got a dish that's made of a, of a, a conducting fabric. And it, I'm just trying to find a shot of it. It's, um, it expands like an umbrella in about 20 seconds. He brought it here to demonstrate. It's used by portable EMEs on, uh, on uh, 2.4 gigs predominantly. And I, I know I've got a picture of it here somewhere. Of course, I'll never find it when you want it in a hurry. But it's um, it, it it has to be conductive, but it doesn't have to be metallic. So it his is covered with a sort of a conducting plastic membrane that uh, that springs out. No, I'm not finding it. Sorry about that. I was, uh, it was a, quite interesting. It's quite interesting. I'll keep looking while you're talking. But anyway, I'd like to thank on behalf of everybody. I'd like to thank Doug for his excellent presentation tonight. There's obviously a lot of work has gone into uh, to thinking about what's been involved with that and what's involved with, with dishes. Like many things, they're more complicated than they seem at first glance. And uh, I'd like to, on your behalf, thank him for putting that together for us. Thanks, Doug. Happy to. And uh, the invitation... Let's go to Kevin. The invitation is... Catch the side later, in, later on the next few days. Catch you, bye. Bye. Yeah, good night, Bruce. I found uh -huh. it. If I can get it to open. Am I going to be able to show this? Where's the camera? Uh, it's on here. This, where is it? No, but where's the camera on, on computer? Here.
Here's some dish. You can actually see this is looking through Carl's dish from the back. You can actually see the sunshine shining through it. And that's that metallic uh, fabric that's conductive. That, that dish is just over two meters in diameter and it, it packs up and looks like an umbrella and you press the key on the back and it just springs out. It's a terrible view. I'm sorry about that. That's the best I can do at the moment. But this row of pictures in the middle, you can see, you can actually see through the dish. I might um, stop the recording now if that's... Um... Yeah, go that's ahead. It. Thanks, Peter.